All right, Susan. So welcome. We've got a lot of people here that have joined us, so that's great. Um, every I sent everybody a little introduction about Donna, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Just to say that I have met Donna at several literacy conferences, and she has an amazing background and an amazing zest for the children in our field, and I'm going to let her take it over and share her wisdom with us. And just a reminder, folks, uh, two ways to communicate. One, of course, is by uh, chat, and the other is by putting up your hand or simply turning your uh, your mic uh, off mute and just uh, stepping on in. So uh, welcome, Donna, and the way you go. Thank you, Roy, and thank you, Susan. I'm absolutely delighted that uh, you reconnected with me and invited me. The content I'm going to share with you in the next hour is absolutely some of my favorite teaching content. So. I'm really happy to be talking about it with you this afternoon. So it's about teaching and working smart. And so I have 45 teaching strategies in 60 minutes. So it means I'm going to do a lot of talking. But I'm going to pause periodically. And Susan and Roy said they would be watching for your, your hands or your comments and so forth. Because I would like it to be somewhat interactive. Uh, so that I'm just not talking for 60 minutes staring at my computer screen. But speaking of my computer screen, I do want to tell you about the photo because um, I call them my digital age babies. And these digital age babies have really caused me to hesitate, stop, and rethink uh, how I go about teaching um, children in the digital age. And so on um, the left-hand side is Olivia, who's my granddaughter. In this photo, she's probably about um, three years old, and she's 10 now. And then sitting next to Olivia um, is Ethan. And by the way, Olivia is fully sighted. Ethan is blind, and he's three years old. And then sitting next to Ethan is my grandson, Aiden. And he's about one, and he's fully sighted. And in front of Aiden is um, Evie. Evie is a sister to Ethan, and she is blind. And so these children all live in my community. They all go to the public school where I used to teach. And when Olivia and, uh, was born, and I saw how kids in the digital age were developing literacy skills in early childhood, it was fascinating to me as a person who was really interested in early childhood education. And then I'm watching Aiden after he was born. And then at the time, Ethan was my student. and. Um, and then Evie was born. So my challenge was I knew that all these children would be going to kindergarten together. So Olivia and Ethan would be going to kindergarten together, and Aiden and Evie would be going to kindergarten together. So my challenge as a teacher of children who are blind was to provide these early childhood parallel experiences and literacy for Ethan and Evie that were similar to Olivia and Aiden. So it really caused me to step back from how I always taught and rethink. So a lot of uh, the teaching strategies I'm sharing with you um, this afternoon came from some deliberate and an intentional uh, reflective um, thinking. So just so you know what I'm doing now, I left teaching about 10 years ago. I taught for 32 years. Um, here in rural Minnesota, and um, now I've been a consultant for about 10, 10 years. And, and what that means is I just help a variety of people. I provide technical assistance, and I just help people who, who I say are doing a good job teaching children and just help them do it better. So I do program improvement. I do instructional coaching. I do mentoring. I do teacher training. I'm currently adjunct. Um, 
in a fun way, I like to refer to myself as an activist because um, I like to continue to see change in our field and how we're teaching. So <clears throat> when I present this at a conference, the objectives that I share with people are, are um, for this content is to improve effective teaching, implement strategies to improve student results, and increase collaborative strategies with parents and all team members. So <clears throat> this next slide um, about this presentation, um, if you look at the photo, it's this old, old looking prospector and, and sometimes that's how I feel. You know, I've been shaking through all the content in our field and I'm pretty old now and what I have left when I shake through all the content is what I call these gold nuggets. So I'm sharing with you these teaching strategies that I consider to be gold nuggets. And I think a lot of the content can, to, can apply to a lot of the kids who we teach, kids who are blind and use Braille, kids who have low vision and use print, kids with additional disabilities. Uh, I think you can modify the content for all ages and um, for kids in a variety of uh, environments. So by working smart, smart for me is an acronym, and it means systematically, it means meaningful to students and families, arranged collaboratively, results focused, and teaching effectively. So those are the things that I think about, and those are the things that I, uh, when I go and give technical assistance, I um, hope to help people do these things better. So. Um, just a little bit about informing our work as um, teachers for children and with visual impairments um, in, in this day and age is I just want to say there are um, many competing priorities for our time with children. And um, I think our children are complicated, they're complex, and there are so many elements of um, teaching within the context of general education and the context of special education um, that um, make our teaching time with children um, sometimes a struggle. So um, we have to, when we have time with children, we have to really know those effective teaching strategies. So that's what these 45 strategies are. So <clears throat> when I use the term accomplished teachers to talk about teachers who have mastered their content. And accomplished teachers focus on instruction. So I want um, you to think about how this, uh, what this means for you in terms of um, how you're able to describe what you teach, where you teach, how you teach, and why you teach. Because accomplished teachers um, are able to describe um, these elements of instruction. So my strategy number one is to, to just be systematic with an overall approach to instruction. So when I think about um, when I was teaching, when I think about how to deliver services to children with visual impairments, I had um, a systematic approach that I would think about. So I would think about time for instructional coaching, I call it RICE, R-I-C-E. So it would be reflective practice to always reflect on what I do, how I do it, why I do it. Um, then instructional coaching, um, collaboration, and then effective instruction. And for the, the content in this presentation today, I'm just focusing on effective instruction. But I think very deliberately and systematically about the, all the areas because I like um, elements such as this to affect how I think about delivering services rather than just my driving time, how am I, how am I going to try and fit in the minutes that I'm required to deliver to students. So to get beyond that, I try to, I, I use this um, model of a systematic approach to instruction. So um, I'm just going to now jump to the agenda. So I have four, four items in the area of instruction that I think about in a systematic manner. I think about how we plan instruction, how we manage instruction, how we deliver instruction, and how we evaluate instruction. 
So I'm going to start with the strategies for delivering instruction. Um, because so often that gets pushed out by the other elements and our time with kids is very important. So now, um, Susan said that um, she shared with you my handout, but I call it an instructional planning tool. I consider it more than a handout. I consider it, consider it a teaching tool. So um, all the uh, strategies that I'm going to share with you um, are in this handout and or tool. And why I call it a tool and why I put it in a Word document is I want you to be able to take this document and what I call make it your own. I want you to use this document as your own teaching tool, modify it, change it. If you share it, just always give um, credit to me, but um, uh, I want you to um, make it your own and use it as an instructional tool. You can use it with individual students to brainstorm. Um, you can use it uh, when considering the needs of the students on your caseload. So I'm going to begin with some um, overall instructional strategies. And strategy number two is increased frequency. So this is an overall um, research-based effective and strategy for all children. Uh, we know in education that if you increase frequency of the content of whatever you're teaching, that you're going to most likely improve student learning and outcomes. So I have um, an example here uh, to get you thinking about uh, spelling. So if you think about um, the application of the strategy increasing frequency to how for example, first and second grade teachers push out spelling, um, you'll understand what I mean about frequency. So for example, um, on Monday, the teachers introduce maybe 10 spelling words. They include them in a reading lesson. On Tuesday, they have the students write their spelling words, on, and they're sent home to practice for homework. On Wednesday, they uh, work with their peers in a game on their spelling words. On Thursday, they write them in a sentence. They've probably already looked them up in the dictionary. And then on Friday, um, you know what happens. So Friday is the test. And how do you think the kids do? Well, they usually get 90% or more because of the frequency with which that was taught. So you know those of us as itinerant teachers, um, are challenged with um, pushing out frequency. But if we find ways to do it, and, and that's where collaboration really comes into um, its own importance, um, you can increase frequency. So then strategy number three is increased variety. And if you think to how I just described um, how a teacher in a first or second grade classroom would push out spelling words for the week, I also describe the variety of ways in which she uh, teaches the spelling words. So there's a variety of presentation methods, there's a variety of materials, and there's a variety of formats. So this is all um, also where we're really challenged as, as teachers, is to, um, especially when we're use, uh, teaching Braille, is to um, create that variety in presentation of um, what we're teaching and use a variety of materials and in a variety of formats. And in this um, photo here, this was um, a year ago in summer. I was actually doing some tutoring and mentoring of um, a teacher who came to live with me for three weeks from Micronesia. And she was teaching um, Ethan and Evie. And they were, um, mm, nine, Ethan was nine years old in this photo. Um, and uh, Evie um, was um, mm, seven, I guess. And, um, and here I was demonstrating to the teacher I was mentoring a Braille lesson. I was creating a uh, variety in presentation and materials and format. So what I did was um, use my grandchildren, uh, Olivia and Aiden, 
and you can tell by uh, their interactions that they're used to supporting and being peer supports to students who are blind. Um, and they're doing a scavenger hunt um, out on their property. And um, so they had um, a list of um, the items they were supposed to find in Braille and, and um, uh, applying it to this context. So strategy number four is to consider duration. And I have the um, uh, note here to use quick tasks. So here's, here's what I uh, is sometimes a surprise to people when I talk about duration and the use of quick tasks is I mean you don't need 20 minutes to teach a concept, review a concept, and include it. Um, you need three minutes, three to five minutes. So that's where I use the concept of quick tasks. And I have a definition for it, um, and it's on your instructional tool. And they're basically portable teaching activities that are easily and seamlessly delivered in many contexts. Um, uh, and so what it is is I, I create um, and you see on the sheet that I put um, on the screen here, um, daily activities. And there's just a list of things. And this came from a particular student I was teaching um, back in the day. And um, so it was a student who needed to learn um, Braille. And so what I had was these uh, specific teaching activities for all these different areas on this sheet. And I had three to five. Uh, specific, what I call quick tasks for each area, and there was a pair, of two pair of professionals who, who were working with this student, and so in in a file box and in a um, a Ziploc baggie for each of the teaching activities, I would have these um, uh, acti the materials and the activities all laid out. So if the pair of professional found three to five minutes uh, during class time, they could quickly um, push in one of these activities to get that frequency um, in um, uh, teaching activities to um, increase student outcomes. So I'm going to take a brief uh, break here and ask Roy and Susan if there's um, any comments or questions or Anything looks like, like looks, looks like everybody's riveted to your uh, to your presentation. We see nothing yet. Okay, Susan, is there anything you want me to comment? No, I'm just I'm just thinking that the quick tasks is actually I think that would work well with within our environment because so often we are not able to see the kids with the frequency we'd like. Right. So. Um, right. So. Um, you know, explaining in more detail the quick tasks, um, like takes an hour, and would and so sometime if we ever have the opportunity for follow up, I'd like to share with you. But I want okay. to talk about this photo. So this is what it looked like when I was popping in to do tutoring because when um, Chelsea was here and I was mentoring her and she was doing the teaching, she got sick, right? So I had to pop in and do the teaching of Ethan and Evie. And that's what it looked like when I got done. <laughs> so it's not a pretty pretty sight. And so um, to manage the instructional environment that we teach in, um, I really think that we have to manage the physical environment and, and plan uh, with detail. But what you see here on the floor and spread on the couch, um, are a lot of my quick tasks. You see the, the Ziploc baggies and things pulled out. Obviously, I didn't get them put back in, but uh, that's one of the ways I manage um, the physical environment, especially when I'm collaborating with others and um, pushing out content to others and, and um, what we call role release, right? So, um, uh, whoops. So strategy number five is begin with furniture. Um, when I um, do technical assistance, sometimes I work for school districts, sometimes I work for families. I always begin with the furniture. 
in terms of I'm very particular about height. I'm very particular about how um, how the physical environment is arranged for um, students to be able to read and write with the efficiency that sighted students read and write print. So you just see in this context um, uh, one of the setups. I mean, there are a variety of setups to do with furniture, but this was somewhat of an L-shaped so that the student had the ability to read Braille at their desk and then just pivot in their seat to, to do writing. Um, so, uh, and sometimes I chuckle when I'm uh, new to doing technical assistance to an area um, and working with a teacher um, for kids who are visually impaired. Um, and let's say I'm working there two days in a row. So it's not unusual um, when I go back the second day after the first day to find out that the teacher found a custodian and they worked um, at the end of the school day and into the evening to find furniture and redo the setup. So yeah, I always chuckle when that happens. So then in terms of looking at the physical environment, it, to always um, create access to materials so students can be independent in uh, managing their own, own classroom materials. And then strategy seven is uh, a teaching strategy in terms of how you set up the physical environment. And um, this is kind of, strategy seven is really big for me. Um, I say to consider proximity. So managing the element of proximity is one of the mm, really effective teaching strategies to influence um, student behavior. So here you see um, um, a teacher who I mentored. Um, a number of years ago, and one of the things that um, I, I really emphasize when I teach is, is try to minimize the amount of time that you sit next to a student. And especially for kids who are, are being educated in a gen ed classroom, this happens to be a resource setting um, in this photo. But this little boy spent a lot of time in the gen, general education classroom. So I wanted the teacher of the visually impaired, who you see standing in black, to always, as much as possible, imitate the teaching style of what the student would experience in the gen, general education classroom. So I, I encourage teachers to stand as much as possible. Um, if they need to sit down, that they sit opposite, uh, create the uh, environment where they sit opposite the student. Um, or then if they have to provide manual guidance and if it's important for certain contexts, then to sit next to the student. Um, so that's, a, and in the background here, by the way, you just see a, um, a paraprofessional and um, I call them access specialists. I train them specifically to think about um, how they step in and step out, and this is when the paraprofessional is stepping out and she's doing some interlining there. So um, I'm going to move on to instructional variables. I'm just going to hesitate here. Um, Roy or Susan, anybody have anything to say? Did I lose you guys? I'm not hearing anything. Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Oh, it's, it's okay, Donna. Yeah, no, no problem, Donna. Okay. <laughs> I thought I lost you guys. I was going to go look at to see if I was still linked up. Okay. So we no, can... you're okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about some strategies around um, instructional variab variables now. So one of the uh, strategy eight is scaffolding instructional supports. So I talk about evolve your teaching. And what I mean is think about how you um, provide initial instruction, 
and then um, and the instructional supports you use in an in initial instruction, and then how how those supports change over time when you expect student mastery. And I'm going to um, uh, clarify this through an example of um, orientation and mobility. It's the easiest for me to use this as an example. I'm also a certified orientation and mobility specialist. So when I'm uh, coaching others um, who are teaching orientation and mobility, a lot of um, it's not unusual for me to um, work with teachers um, across time uh, when I'm mentoring them. And let's say a student is learning a route in a building. So um, when you do initial instruction, for example, on teaching a student um, a route in a building, you are giving a lot of verbal supports. Maybe you're pointing out a lot of tactile information, and you're staying close in terms of proximity. Um, maybe you're stepping in to do some manual guidance, and if, if it's a student who uses a cane, how they're using their cane, and so forth. Um, but I want you to think about um, how you step back and when you expect student mastery. So when you expect a student to master a route, you really increase that proximity. You know, you, maybe you're way down the hallway. Um, you try and limit verbal supports limit manual guidance, and so forth. So it's an element of instruction. I encourage people to think about uh, with greater intentionality. And um, so when you're doing academic instruction, um, when you're doing, say, some initial instruction on maybe how to write a sentence, either print or braille, you're right in that student's instructional space giving them a lot of inputs, um, uh, prompting them, and so forth. But when you expect that student to write a sentence independently, then it should look different. You should be uh, have stepped out of their space. You should maybe give them an assignment and expect them to do it independently and so forth. So that's... Um, um, uh, and so why I point this out, because when teachers are um, using a um, instruction um, design when they're of being one-on-one -on -one with students. Sometimes it's really hard to step back when you expect student mastery. So strategy nine is, is to consider levels of instruction. And we most often consider levels of instruction when we think about reading. Um, that's where they really got pushed out back in the day. So when we think about reading levels, we think about an independent reading level, we think about instructional, and we think about frustrational uh, level of reading. So when we're teaching reading, this is for um, all, all, all kinds of reading, um, not just teaching kids who are blind and visually impaired. You know, we try to stay away from a student's frustrational level because um, it's challenging for them to learn at that level. So when, when we teach a student, we want to make sure we're at their instructional level. And then when we want to give kids practice, we want it to be at their independent level. So I think about all these levels in, in all aspects of um, subject areas when I'm teaching students and think deliberately about my lessons in terms of um, I want to make sure I have enough information about the student so that I'm not teaching um, at their frustrational level, that I'm teaching where they can learn. And then um, when I expect them to uh, do something independently, I need to make sure it's at their independent level and not their instructional level. So strategy 10, then, is to provide independent practice. So independent practice should be a part of one-on-one -on -one teaching. When you look at um, instruction in a classroom by general education teachers, students spend a lot of time 
uh, working independently. And so often with our kids, um, when we're working on one-on-one, -on -one is um, sometimes I think it's hard to provide that time for independent practice because we think that we need to maximize that time when we're with them. But it's really important to also give them time for independent practice um, because that's when we can um, transition those skills for when we're not there. And um, I think it's important for kids' self-esteem that they learn that they can um, do independent learning activities on their own and, and don't always need an adult um, telling them what to do. So strategy 11 um, in order to foster that is using procedure, procedures and routines. And here you see Chelsea, um, who's tutoring easy um, and who I mentored um, when she was here. And um, I use a lot of um, uh, what I call structured learning techniques. Um, a lot of the, I call it just structured learning. It comes from uh, uh, the area of um, strategies that teachers use with kids who have autism. Um, or also there's some uh, strategies from, if you Google a website called Peach, P-E-A-C-C-H, um, there's a lot of uh, structured learning. But whatever you teach, um, consider procedures and routines. And here um, you see uh, the procedures and routines in terms of Evie was doing some sorting activities. So on her... I have to think left and right here. On her left-hand side is what we call a start bin, and then she's got three trays, and that's her work area. And then on her uh, right area is her finished um, bin or finished tray. And so um, whatever we were teaching, Evie really benefited from structured learning, and whatever we taught her, we started with um, putting the items in the uh, start tray, and then she'd work with them um, in the center area, and then she'd finish. Because what this creates for kids is that context of predictability. And um, kids who are blind really, all kids like predictability. Kids who are blind really like that predictability. And then also when you use procedures and routines, it really transitions well to independent learning activities. Uh, for students. So strategy 12 is to provide a model. When you think about uh, general education classrooms and um, all the information that's in a classroom that teachers put around uh, on boards, um, they also have a lot of um, models that um, kids have right on their desks. Um, and a model really helps kids. So so often in our busy world as being itinerant teachers, you know, we just pop in and it's like, okay, we got to push out this lesson and we tell rather than show and tell. So if you just think about show and tell as part of your teaching style um, and and take the time to create models for for teach for students to work from. Um, it, it increases their um, outcomes. So strategy 13 is to use task analysis. So um, I'm a golfer, um, not so much anymore, as much as I like, but um, I am. So there is a term, if any of you aren't golfers, that we call the sweet spot. So if you see on the club, it, it's that, that red spot on, on the club head where when you hit the ball on the sweet spot, you know it through your whole body. It just feels right, and your ball goes sailing the way it should uh, into the air. So I call that um, uh, the point for kids, their sweet spot in learning is the point between knowing and not knowing. And uh, when you can find that sweet spot with kids, um, then you can um, really discover where to teach to help them move forward. So kids get stuck. And so that's where when we really need to use task analysis, 
break it down, collect data, examine the teaching learning context, and try and find and break down that spot between what a student knows and what they don't know. So you can figure out how to bridge that gap. So strategy 14 is to use an incentive. Um, and I just want to emphasize this is part of good teaching. Um, uh, it's not bribes. Uh, we all, as uh, people in general, benefit from uh, having incentives. And here you have um, Chelsea when she was tutoring. Um, she's teaching Ethan. And um, he loves to play games. Um, so an incentive for him in doing braille reading and writing would be to play a game uh, with him. And here they were playing um, Beyblades. So um, I've learned a lot about playing in, with digital age kids. Uh, my grandkids uh, keep me uh, up to date on, on play skills. So um, stay up to date on play skills. Uh, strategy 15 is very prompt. So I could probably talk 15 minutes about uh, prompts. This is an area when I'm coaching. Um, especially coaching paraprofessionals, um, I, I um, spend a lot of time on. So one of the things I help people uh, learn to do is to use explicit praise. Um, when you think about, um, uh, I don't like to word, use the word feedback, but I'm going to use it here. When we think about how sighted kids get feedback from teachers, there's a lot of nonverbal communication, along with the words, good job, good work. Now, the, the sighted kids know when a teacher says good job and good work, what they did a good job on and what they did good work on. And sometimes teachers don't give verbal praise, they just do a thumbs up. And, and sometimes uh, observe a teacher teaching sighted kids and their facial expression, their body language, and how often uh, a child gets praise. So I encourage um, people who are instructing kids with low vision and who are blind to use praise with greater f frequency, use verbal praise, but then use it um, with explicit things. Instead of just saying, good job, it would be, I really like how you got your paper loaded into the Braille writer. You, um, you independently um, walked down the hall and, and found your classroom. Good job. So um, sometimes it takes some practice, and that's why I coach people in doing it. Um, Another thing um, I've learned to do over the years is to uh, limit question asking with um, students and um, prompt with um, telling. So instead, uh, and if you um, observe people when they're teaching, um, kids who are blind, they use question asking with greater frequency than they use with sighted students. It's a, um, a very interesting dynamic. So when I want to find out what a student knows, um, so my prompt is, tell me or show me. Instead of saying, can you or will you, um, uh, um, and, and using a question. And then the other area that I spend a lot of time supporting people in is uh, using explicit correction procedures, especially paraprofessionals. Um, I, I really um, spend a lot of time supporting people and not using the word no, um, but saying, try again. I like how you did that. Let's try it again, um, and so forth. Um, and what I, I do with people is sometimes brainstorm with particular students and with particular um, subject areas uh, and teaching strategies is what is the explicit correction procedure you can use. 
and then I have them write it out and keep it with them. So why, when they're learning to, to use that, um, because you and I know that uh, a lot of our students can become prompt dependent. So it's a way of, um, um, all these strategies are a way of, um, oh, eliminating that prompt dependency on students. So there's, you know, a lot more to this, but these are just some elements that I can quickly share with you. So strategy 16 is to create turn-taking opportunities. So when we teach one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's, um, uh, we don't think about this element nor take the time to do it, but turn-taking um, is, is um, just a really effective way to break up instruction, to make it more dynamic. And um, I just am um, always trying to find a way to integrate peers into taking turns. Uh, when I don't have peers around, I use myself um, to take turns. I use a lot of um, game formats um, when I teach to, to create a more dynamic um, uh, lesson. So, um, Anything anybody wants to say right now? Susan, Roy, you guys still there? Well, I'll just chime in, Don, and, and say that we're at uh, 4.11. Uh, we've got 19 minutes left, so just... Uh, no, keep rolling. Keep rolling right on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a lot to share, right? Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so I'm going to just roll right through this stuff. So about blind and braille. I can't emphasize enough around tactile discrimination to focus on what fits under fingertips. In the handout I gave you, I just say it's really, I, I don't know how I say it, but it's seduct seductive to use a lot of fun visual stuff um, uh, and represent Braille in other ways, but there is no research that suggests that Braille concepts um, represented in, in other ways um, helps kids learn Braille in terms of what sits under their fingertips. So focus, focus on tactile strategies on Braille that fits under a fingertip. Strategy 18 is uh, what I call individual access. It kind of goes back to the provide a model but I call it poster prompts. If a student is getting particularly stuck on something, um, I have them, uh, um, I provide a, a um, tactile example, especially for Braille um, readers. So if they're stuck on a particular symbols they get stuck on or numbers or whatever, I have um, uh, uh, posters in Braille that I put on their desk so they can refer to them themselves so they can do their own self-correction. And so um, strategy 19 is to teach copying. Um, I have a, a worksheet here, and if you think about all the ways that sighted kids learn print, um, they're copying, copying, copying. And um, our students who are blind um, have much less opportunities for copying. And in order to, to get at that accuracy that kids need, I, I, use, I deliberately teach copying, um, and uh, they have to do it with uh, accuracy. So strategy 20 is anchor materials. Um, you see in the photo, this is um, when I was on a, a plane, the mother next to me had a four-year-old, and she created this whole play space with a roll of painter's tape. So painter's tape is my friend. Um, I'm always anchoring materials for blind kids um, using painter's tape. Um, so they're not moving around. So I don't have to be in their space holding the materials in place. I, that way I can get out of their space and it works really well. Up in the uh, top right corner, you just see anchoring materials with magnetic materials. I use Velcro, I use Legos, 
I use stuff that can stay in place. Um, now about low vision strategy, strategy 21 is just begin accommodations early. Um, but I think the earlier we begin accommodations for kids who have low vision, uh, the more likely are they to use them when they get older. Think multiple solutions for kids with low vision. And for all our kids, there's more than one right way to um, push out um, instruction and get the results you need. Strategy 23 is provide specialized instruction. I say this in particular to low vision is because so often, um, usually due to time, we have this tendency to drop off materials um, for kids with low vision um, and then head out. But I uh, really believe in um, creating time to provide that specialized instruction with the, the tools and the accommodations um, in the actual classroom. So for kids with additional learning strategies, strategy 24 is use um, highly preferred content. This is an old tool. Um, it's a recorder um, where you can record specific content. Um, I use it all the time with kids with um, additional learning challenges. I try to use a lot of speech tools with Braille for kids um, uh, with additional learning challenges because audio is frequently a preferred learning style. Um, I individualized content. This was um, a menu when I was play, playing a restaurant with Ethan when he was a preschooler or uh, maybe a kindergarten age. And so he was really into certain foods and restaurants because he had just done a trip. And so I individualized his Braille instruction uh, with uh, a menu. Um, strategy 26 is provide intensive training support. So I use a specific coaching model um, when I'm uh, working with others, especially paraprofessionals. And, and um, so what I'm just going to say is, is, again, find a systematic way to um, uh, train and work with others. So um, I'm just going to move into uh, evaluate. Um, strategy 27 is evaluate students with accuracy and with detail. So if I am just uh, have an example of using, um, uh, this was actually Ethan when I was assessing his Braille skills a couple years ago. Um, I did a qualitative analysis of his miscues. So um, the first um, few columns are, are miscues that you would use for any student. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, I added um, Braille errors, and I separated you know, things that were confusers and contractions. And by evaluating him with this um, accuracy and detail, I could find that sweet, sweet spot you know, in terms of instruction in, in Braille. Um, strategy 28, uh, think um, evaluation with formative and summative. Formative is when you step in and do um, evaluation as you're teaching. Summative is when you want to see if they master content. So think intentionally about collecting information formatively and, and then summatively. And then um, when you're um, evaluating instruction, consider the variety of contexts kids are learning in, thinking about reading and writing and English language arts, math, non-academics at home. This happens to be Ethan when he was younger at home with his dad. Um, um, and they were using some refreshable Braille. Strategy 30, 30 is um, collect data systematically. I encourage people to think about Wednesday as Data Wednesday. Kids are most often in school on Wednesdays. Um, sometimes they're not in school on Mondays or Fridays, so those aren't great days to collect data, but Wednesday's always good. So just pick a day that you focus on. You want to make sure you know how your kids are doing. Strategy 31, then, is adjust instruction. So you should change what you're doing. Um, uh, based on the uh, information you collect 
um, on students. That's why we assess. And I just love this quote a lot. It's, um, it pops up on Facebook periodically. If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way we learn. So um, I think it's an, it, it, it's an incredible guide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about planning instruction. Strategy 32 is um, apply uh, instruction in an integrated manner. So um, uh, you see these um, bubbles of reading, writing, listening, speaking. So that's how kids with disabilities learn. They learn um, all in this bubble, whereas if you look at the uh, graphic on the bottom, it's this kind of hierarchy way of learning or a linear way. So um, I try to avoid waiting um, and think about um, integrating reading, writing, listening, and speaking and not waiting until a child has mastered something before I teach something else. Because uh, sometimes we limit what a student can learn by uh, thinking about instruction in a linear or a hierarchical um, format. Strategy 33 is use rubrics. The example I have here was um, for uh, a student who had low vision who was using an assistive technology tool. And so um, whenever you think about goals and objectives, think about how you're going to measure them uh, in a way that you can um, look at student um, progress. So strategy 34 is um, use curriculum as a foundation. You know, there's so much that we need to teach that um, uh, I really, when I pop in and, and um, give technical assistance, I really um, help teachers move to a curriculum as a foundation um, for instruction. And then it's kind of like a springboard. You can springboard from this foundational curriculum. But what I find if people don't use curriculum as a foundation, uh, they can be um, somewhat random in, in their approach to instruction. So this gives them that systematic way to approach instruction. Strategy 35 is to just take time to plan access, plan accommodations, and plan modifications. And I don't have time to speak to it here, but so often our kids um, not only need accommodations, but need modifications. And um, that takes some systematic planning. Um, so, you know, we're really thinking about all these things. So when you think about a math class, you know, what materials are a, a student going to um, use to access the curriculum, what other accommodations need to be in place, and then do there need to be some modifications in the content. So strategy 36 is planned participation. So, um, so with all the, the access and accommodations is how will the student actually participate? How will they engage in instruction? So um, get into that authentic learning context and see how students participate. And then plan for collaboration. And I just have a, a, a map uh, set that was used here that was a collaboration between a Braille transcriber, the teacher of the visually impaired, and the classroom teacher um, to, uh, for a student to access and participate um, in a geography lesson uh, that, was, that was New York. Um, and then strategy 38 is in terms of materials. Um, I just always, if I'm making flashcards or if I'm making uh, materials, I think about make two. So if I make two, th two things, two sets, I can play games with it. I can send a set home to get that frequency at home. Um, so I just always duplicate um, what I'm making. Um, strategy 39 nine is prepare for real-time instruction. Um, when it, especially when you think about math, when a teacher um, may deviate from the planned lesson and realize they need to reteach something, they go to the board, especially for math problems. So think how a student with low vision or a student who's blind is going to access that real-time instruction in a classroom. So in terms of managing instruction, um, uh, just 
the tip of considering all environments and all subjects. Um, take time to know uh, what the student's day looks like, where they are, how they're um, uh, participating in social studies, science, and all subject areas. And in order to do that, my strategy is vary your schedule. So this is the teacher who I've been mentoring. Um, in another state, I see her about three times a year. And here she's varied her schedule in order to show up. And in uh, actual, uh, this was a science classroom. She's um, uh, supporting the classroom teachers and having peers um, uh, so, uh, facilitate the participation of the student with low vision. I use uh, uh, this phrase, chunk for change. If you have to create change, and I know this is hard uh, for you in Alberta, but um, I try to show up with greater frequency, sometimes several days in a row, if there's something I need to implement in terms of a, a teaching strategy, a behavioral strategy. So I call it chunking uh, my time for ch change. Um, I try to involve peer supports, multi-age supports. Here you see in the photo, Ethan, I was um, teaching him mobility a few summers ago. He wasn't really keen on the idea of uh, it being called a mobility lesson, so I just pulled in Olivia and Aiden, I gave them canes, and we went out on a penny walk. Ethan had no idea I was instructing him uh, in mobility. Um, and cane travel, and they just thought it was just a fun uh, way to play. Um, I used a lot, I used community-based um, lessons. I give touch tours. Um, this is uh, Evie. This is when um, uh, my mentor was here and we were out picking strawberries. So strategy 45 is take the instructional planning tool that I um, sent to you, make it yours. Just don't have it sit there, um, print it out, keep it accessible as a file, and modify it, and, and change it up to make it yours. OK. <laughs> um, that's working smart, uh, systematically, meaningful to students and families, arranged collaboratively, results focused, teaching effectively. I want to thank you uh, for listening to my golden nuggets. And um, here you have uh, Ethan and his over, older brother Jackson um, playing games together. And uh, Jackson used to like to blindfold himself to put himself what he called on an equal um, playing level with his siblings. So I'm done talking. Susan and Roy. Thank you so much, Kathy. I can't, uh, Donna, I can't believe you got that done in the hour. But you, you've certainly given us lots of nuggets to think about. And I think this is a great um, template for us to use to organize ourselves. And I'm wishing I was out there still doing this because I'm getting all excited again about the possibilities that this involves. So thank you. And it, it, I think we might just have to have you come back and be and elaborate on some of these strategies because there is a lot of um, good information you provided today. So not enough time, but well, thank you, Susan. It, it really, uh, I, I mean, I really have a blast doing this. And I last call for any questions from anybody. Any, I know Kathy's put a lot of things in the chat window. She's, she's got yes and lots of yeses and amazing and thank you. Oh, and something, there's other people that are saying thank you. So there's um, lots of comments in the chat window thanking you, Donna. So um, if everybody is finished, we will uh, end the meeting then. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everybody um, uh, taking the time to uh, out of your busy days at the end of your busy day. And um, it would be fun to stay in touch. 
And for those people who didn't get the handout, because I really sent it only to the PLC group, um, I see Tracy Buddy, you want a copy of the handout, so I will send it to you. Okay, thank you, everybody. And Donna will keep in touch. Okay, good night. Okay, good night. Bye. Bye.